Hi guys, welcome to my channel. I'm Johanna. I love ancient history. If you're new here, then come down, come to the front, have a little seat, get a bevy, because today's gonna be interesting. One of the biggest questions that we have about the ancient past is just how did they cut and move and transport such huge megalithic stones? Like the pyramids, how were the pyramids built? It is an ongoing mind boggler and no one for sure really knows how. So it is a lot of fun trying to hypothesize and theorize what could have happened. I met a man called Stephen Tasker. He came on the Egypt tour that we did, I think last September, and he was fascinating. Going around Egypt with this man, he is an engineer and he just looks at everything through a sort of, through his eyes, through a different lens. And I thought that his theories on how the pyramids were built and how they could move and transport ancient megalithic stone was super fascinating. And I'd never heard it before. And I thought you guys should hear it too. So buckle up, get comfortable, get a drink, get a snack. It's gonna be great. But before we do deep dive into that part of history, I wanted to shout out the sponsor of this video. I don't do sponsored posts very often. I tend to wait until I see something that I genuinely really would like and appreciate, and I think that you guys would too. So I'd like to shout out Historic Mail. Historic Mail is a unique gift for history buffs to connect with the past through the lost art of letter writing. Every week, you'll receive an envelope delivered to your doorstep containing a meticulously crafted reproduction of a letter penned by an important historical figure. I love letters. Do you remember in the day, like back in the day when you had pen pals and you could find somebody to write to? I don't know, it's just a lost art. Like when was the last time that you actually picked up a pen or got anything in the post that wasn't like a bill or delivery? Do you know what I mean? Let's open it. Historic mail. <laughs> oh my God. It is like, like the handwritten letter. Now this is where reading handwriting is like a lost historic art as well. Dear Mrs. Lucci? Lucin. Luc. Oh, John Kennedy. John, Ke it's a letter from John Kennedy in 1942. I came home yesterday and dad gave me your letter. Historic Mail is a really thoughtful gift for anyone who really loves history and appreciates the art of letter writing. It also makes a great gift for people who have everything. You know, you're like, oh, what can I get them? They literally have everything. I'll tell you what they don't have, a personal letter by Walt Disney. That's what they don't have. It was started by a group of history enthusiasts who just relished at the idea of receiving a personal letter from George Washington or Thomas Edison. Every week, a stamped envelope arrives at your doorstep containing a reproduction of a historical letter. It also contains a supporting document, giving you all the context and the historical background to the letter and a typed version of the letter in case like me, you find handwriting a little bit hard. So the American History Gift Pack covers letters from 1766 with the founding of the Republic all the way to 1967 with the Cold War at its height. Featuring letters from the presidents such as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin D. Roosevelt as well as other historical figures who greatly influenced American life such as Walt Disney, Tesla and Twain. So Historic Mail offers 10 weekly letters for $59.99. There are also packs of 25 letters or 52 if you want one for every single day of the year, you can pick and choose. And I'm just saying it's Father's Day. I feel like those two things might go together quite well. And if you would like some money off, then you can just use my code FUNNYOLD and you will get 10% off the entire thing. Where were we? Trip to Egypt, met Stephen Tasker, learned a whole lot about the engineering of obelisks and very heavy stones. What I find really intriguing about this theory is that Stephen has looked at the ancient artwork, the ancient temples, the sculptures, and he's looking at things that we've been looking at for thousands of years, and he's looking at them in a different way. And he posed the question, what if some of the artifacts, the very famous artifacts that we can see on the temple walls in the, in the reliefs, these precious, Egyptian artifacts, what if they have a functional purpose? For example, let's take the Jed pillar, very famous, um, very symbolic artifact thing that they have all over. It's, it's absolutely everywhere in Egypt on the temple walls. There's the whole, there's a whole festival called the raising of the Jed pillar, which they do. I mean, I think they did it up until really recently in Egypt. They, it was like a huge ceremony that they did to raise this huge Jed pillar. It looks very bizarre. If you've ever, do you know what the Jed pillar I'm talking about? Oh, I'm about to get, 
I'm about to get some mail. Pause for thought. Okay. Ugh. Right. Where were we? Jed Pillar. What if the Jed Pillar that you can see in these reliefs, in these images, what if in real life, as a 3D object, it was functional? And what if it wasn't not only symbolic and ceremonial, but what if it also had a function too? I was like, the Jed pillar as an object has always looked a bit odd to me. I mean, looking at it from modern eyes, it almost looks like a, a battery or some, some kind of like electricity telephone pole. Do you know what I mean? It looks, it looks weirdly functional. It also looks a bit like a spine, which makes sense with the esoteric point of view that it was the spine of Osiris and the backbone. But what if it was representing that it was literally the backbone of how you would create structures and move stone and build the society. This is a jed pillar. Right. Nice. Yeah. So you've got the jed pillar. A working and models. A working model. What you don't see is the rope that powers the jet. And you don't see the rope for a reason. Oh, yeah. Because it's sacred science. And because it's really complicated. It gets really, really complicated. So okay. put that one away. Yeah. What holds the jet what holds the jet in position on the corner of the pyramid? Is the crook so the crook will fit around the top of the jed yeah right and then you get people to pull on yeah so we have two volunteers and just pull slowly yeah right okay now that the bottom part is the winch right right so what we need is the third person you will do i'll do right you keep tension on these ropes not too tight but enough so when Johanna pulls the string, these ropes go back onto the screw. Okay, do you pull Johanna? Okay, ready? Okay, boys. Oh, we wind it, but wind the bobbin back up. Well, wind the bobbin back up. Back up again. Right. Okay. And then you walk back with Johanna. So this is an experiment straight out the box. Right. So it's, it's, it's really easy, yeah? And so... So, so, so you I'm... tie another rope around the bottom of this and yeah. pull a stone towards it. So it's a winch. So behind this wall, or behind this false door, there's two winches. This is what I was talking to you about at the table today. Now, <clears throat> the power output of this is 2.3. Uh, 2 .3. You, you divide the circumference, or sorry, the, the circumference of the, of the, the waist of the, of the jet mm -hmm. with the spools. So <clears throat> you can get 2.3 wines to the one wind of the jet at the top. It's like a gearbox. Right, yeah. Yeah. But well, so behind can... there, there's two. So I was asking Evelyn, because <clears throat> I'm not great on pulleys. I'm, I'm not bad at working stuff out, but it's the mathematics behind it. Would another pulley that was creating 2.5 mechanical advantage multiply that one? So would 2.5 times 2.5? Because this freeze <clears throat> on the other two. locations show, show two jets. But other freezes in the top right hand corner and the top left where there's a wire. Yeah. There's six jets joined together. <clears throat> on the depiction of these, you see the jets just slightly touching one another. Yeah. That indicates that one is one's connected to the next. Now I've touched on these before in previous videos, but there are some stone artifacts uh, in Abu Sir that nobody really knows what the hell they are or what the hell they're used for. Uh, one being the alabaster stone bowls and the best guess anyone has up until now that they are ceremonial bowls for probably for like sacrificial or um, religious ceremonies now there is something very odd about them they have these holes in uh, the side of the basin which don't make sense to be drainage holes because realistically if you were say you were sacrificing a, a lamb or something in in this bowl for religious purposes and you wanted to drain the blood out one, um, the hole is at the completely the wrong, it's at, it's at the top of the basin, not the bottom. So it doesn't really work as a drainage hole. Also, these things are alabaster and you'd think that after so many years that they would be stained maybe or after years of sacrificial blood. And I don't think that was the purpose for them. Also, um, we can tell that they used to be lined with copper, which is very important when it comes to this theory. So the theory being that these alabaster stone basins were actually the bottom block, the foundational holding block of the jed pillars. And the basins would have been lined in copper 
And the hole that is in the top is not a drainage hole, but is an entry hole, an entry point for you to slug in oil, basically a lubricant that you will need for the jet pillar to turn. Alabaster base lined with copper, and then on here you would have um, a wooden base of the jet, uh, maybe with like a leather or something that's gonna slip and slide beautifully. Uh, and then you are gonna click your jet pillar into place like so, and then you're gonna have your three-way wire system, your pulley system, that's gonna basically turn this whole thing into a winch. What's also interesting about this theory is that one jed pillar can pull an amount of stone, but you can also stack the jeds up, and the more jeds that you use pulling the same stone, the heavier stone that you can pull, or the less men, you know, works both ways. All you've got to do is feed them back in. You just need a little bit of tension on them, because they're, they're going to go back in, because they're the, they're the rewind ropes. These are the power ropes, so you've got four power ropes, and you've got one tow rope. So we're going to pull these, the red and the blue rope, put a bit of tension down there, pull. What? <laughs> right? Let it be stop. So you see the principle, yeah? Okay. So yeah. it's just a back and forth motion. Yeah. So you, once you got your stone to where you wanted, you'd have another one of these somewhere else on the plateau. So if it was getting pulled this way and you wanted it pulled over, over the, slightly to the left, you'd, this other one would, would be on this tow rope and pull it over to the left, sling it off the sledge. And the only problem you've got, you haven't got 40 men and a sledge to get down, you've just got one sledge to get down and one man to take it down. Um, the, the, the drawback to this machine, it needs a big weight on the top because the load that it's pour, pulling has is, is got a lot of friction under the sledge and the weight of the thing itself. It, you know, it, a pulley will pull anything, but it needs, it needs to be fixed. So this granite beam, I propose, is the, are the granite beams that's above the king's chamber. I think, I'm not 100% sure, there's around about 32 of them. There might be 42, I'm not sure. But that means if these were the beams that held this machine in position, there was 32 of these on the plateau. So if you've got eight ramps, two on each corner, bring in um, all these stones on board, you would need a multiple of like 32, 32 of these machines to pull them into position. As the pyramid gets higher and higher and higher, the room on the, on the pyramid gets less and less and less. The le you, you need less of these. So placing these stones above the king's chamber is a housekeeping effect. It's nothing to do with stability and strength to the to the to the um, king's chamber. Because it doesn't it doesn't it, it help. Just doesn't it? Yeah, you just you couldn't get them off because the ramps are small. Right. <coughs> all the stones that built the pyramid, the big, all the big granite blocks are put on to start with because we've got we've got machines on board that can pull them up ramp wise on the plateau. All we need are the core blocks, which are ninety five percent of them are all two and a half tons or maybe more. Um, the bigger stones, we can, you can just take your time and, and keep pulling them up, pulling them up, pulling them up. Um, I think there may be more granite beams just past the King's Chamber and they probably just left them somewhere as well as, as housekeeping. I'm pretty sure I saw um, a video of, of some pyramid where you could actually see granite beams in and around, in and around um, the course layers on, on the way up. So instead of leaving them up there in, in one big block, I think they've distributed them out. So that's the, the pyramid theory done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Questions before we move on. How would they get the granite up on there? Would it be a similar way the obelisks? I, I, I think so. Yeah. You know, did you sand and and the, the way I was trying to explain to you yesterday that, that they used um, um, a, a, a double pivot system is, is like this plank or this lever has got it's got two pivot points underneath. Yeah. And you can't really see it there, but if we put that on there. If I lift one side up, the gap is very, very small. All you can get under there is a couple of grains of sand. Yeah. And I think that's what they did. A grain of sand, like Johanna said, it's like a... Um, lasagna. Lasagna. That's the word. It's like a lasagna where you put sand and then um, <laughs> uh, a mat in, because then you can get a mat in between. Then Layer more sand. papyrus, <coughs> some more sand, and cheese. It, and then you, you, <laughs> you, know. you work your way up Rego. either side. I've got footage of... Uh, I've, I've, I've actually built an obelisk, or I've built the obelisk. I'm actually trying to raise it at home now. It's about half a ton and eight, 10 foot wide, 10 foot long, I mean. So we can insect in, in some uh, footage of that there. But I think that's how they may have, have raised these 70, 70 grams. Or he could have just towed them up, up a ramp, you know, to the next stage, I think. 
the building stage is only going to be the, the length, the height of this gap here. So once, once, once the, the once say this one has has been drawn to its its position and put down, this sledge is going to be on top of that one, and then tips off another one. So until it gets to the, the gap there, you'll notice on on a, a false door you see a roller at the top. And they say it's for when I say they say Egyptologists uh, uh, assume that it's for. Um, a, re a reed curtain I think or a reed door which it probably is because you don't want any dust coming in here you know what I mean so um, I, th I think it might, might have been sealed, a sealed unit stop the sand and the dust getting in the, so in the, the machine. Is this made of wood or is this made of stone? Well the, all the, 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 the um, false doors are all painted like a, as if they're made out of red granite so I, to be honest I, I don't really know. Because I'm thinking like 52 tons on top of wood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it could be like um, it could, it, I actually think it was probably made of granite um, but for demonstration purposes this yeah. is what it obviously needs more research and these are the early early days of, of this but all the pieces to make this machine at, are at Abu Ghraib we're going to I think is it the last day or the day before yeah. day before so there's the, the there's um, the pivot point no the um, square pivot mm -hmm. there's two there there's there's one with one hole in now I saw Yusuf uh, when when I was there last and he said that the in in a, in a side of it was was uh, sheeted with copper yeah so if this is a pivot pivot point it's like any any modern engine it needs some type of sacrificial bearing so if the first part of it was sheeted with copper right. and that's wood you would need something that's not like a softer metal than that and something that you could recycle they had tons of gold so if they had and that's what i was talking to you last night about these neb baskets yeah right if they had a neb type of basket and put that in there it would then wear out and then they could collect the gold in the there's the hole collect the gold out of the hole and then recycle it <laughs> refilter it yeah and I did read a paper regarding um, Egyptian red gold, which is a mix mixture of copper, which would be that, and a gold. Um, and the Egyptians used this red gold as a type of um, gold leaf that they put on top of uh, coffins, you know, the, the, on top of the faces. You see, it's, it's, a, it's, a, bur it's a burnished red. Um, so that's um, that one. That would solve the problem because um, the kind of, the theory that people were saying when they go, oh, it's a sacrificial bowl and people were sacrificed and this is for the blood to run out. Yeah, yeah, this is a slaughterhouse. But the problem is, is that it's too it's too high. Yeah. If you were going to fill this with water, because yeah. it would only run out to a certain point. But if this was had something in it it would push the oil up, up and out and over yeah, the yeah. top so that make, that kind of solves the problem yeah. of the why that's so high up and there's, not down like there. there's a load of holes around the top i really want to examine as well when i get there yeah um like i put metal pins in in that one i i, I don't think they would have used metal pins i think they would have been uh, like a like a wooden pin or yeah. even something that just forces it into into, into the leather because that it, it would be a leather seal we did use leather seals rather than and then cork it like yeah like a belly button Constant run of oil in it, so you, the oil would go in there right. and come out there. Just keep filling it with oil, so the oil changes all the time. Yeah. So you know, you, so you're not you're not using the, the, the rough oil as, as an abrasive in, again. So that's the they're the they're the two of the two of the two of the, the basins that are at Abu Ghraib. Have other, three holes. The other has three holes. Right. And that on another on the nine of nine of them that's remaining have have one hole. And the others are just broken and scattered around. Right. But there is one or two complete ones, and they all looked. They all seem to have had three holes three at, at one point. Okay. Now Stephen has been making mini models, and he was amazing enough to make one for me and and send it to me for me to test out and and play with the theory. Um, but he's also been making life size, big size models, and uh, he's recently been doing experiments on huge amounts of weight and seeing if it works and. What is interesting is that the theory does work. The physics does work. So here we go. Here's a little bit of footage of Stephen testing out his huge life-size false door and Jed Pillar stone-moving mechanism. Now, Stephen has another theory on how you can apply um, some of this basic concept to create almost a, uh, almost a drill. A, it would be a man-powered... So we're not talking electricity drills here or 
sonic powered or anything like that. We're talking about having a huge man powered rotating drill that would be able to cut stone at a faster speed than a saw could. But I think I'm gonna save that for another video because that's a whole different concept. Are you still with me? <laughs> Amazing. Um, huge thank you to Stephen for sharing his work with me. And I'm very excited to see how it develops and how he keeps trying and testing. I've put links below so you can check out all of Stephen's stuff. Um, if you want any of the historic mail um, sign up, you can go there as well. Now, one more thing to tell you, some housekeeping. I'm going to ancient Turkey. This when are we going? October. I'm going to go and see Gebekli Tepe and the under the underground city in Turkey, the ancient one that nobody really knows what it's for. Um, we're going to visit it in person. If you would like to join us, then I'm also going to put the link there because we have a couple of seats left. And if you would like to be part of the adventure, you are more than welcome to join us in ancient Turkey. It's going to be an amazing 10 day tour and we're going to have an amazing holiday and we're gonna see so many cool things. So if you wanna come with me to Gebekli Tepe, which I think it's on the bucket list of ancient stuff. It is the most ancient temple complex in the world. It is 12,000 years old, guys. It is, it, is, it is like four times older than some of the temples in ancient Egypt, and they were freaking old. So I'm incredibly excited about going and meeting all of you guys, because there's gonna be some old faces that I know from previous tours, and there's gonna be new people. So that's great. <sighs> what do you think? What are you thinking um, of this theory? Do you think that the Jed Pillar and these weird stone objects might have been used together to move stone? Let me know in the comments. I'm always fascinated by what you guys think. And as ever, if you've got any links um, or uh, papers, facts, I, I really do enjoy. I can't reply to everyone, but I do enjoy receiving scientific papers or YouTube videos that you find interesting, new theories. Send them at me. I love them. I hope you have a fantastic week and happy hunting.